common method variance is, is commonly a concern in cross-sectional studies. There are statistical techniques that are supposed to address this issue. Whether those techniques work or not, that's another question. In this video, I will give an overview of some of the more commonly used techniques and I have another set of videos that talk about, talk about the specific aspects of different techniques and their specific problems. But here I just provide an overview of what these techniques are based on and, and what kind of principles we can generally apply to deal with the common method variance problem. The idea of common method variance is that correlations between our measures are driven by the measurement instrument or measurement process instead of being driven by correlations between the constructs. So let, in our hypothetical example here, we have three measures of company innovativeness, three survey measures, three measures of company success, and we find that the scale score of innovativeness and scale score of success correlate at 0.3. Does that mean that the constructs innovativeness and success are correlated or is it possible that these indicators actually simply measure how uh, positively the person thinks about the company, how f commonly the person responds to a right hand side of a scale versus the left hand side or something else that relates to the measurement method instead of relating to the constructs of interest. This is the method variance. Typically statistical models of method variance use this kind of framework. So we assume that all the indicators depend on linearly on these constructs that we measure and uh, they also depend on a single source of method variance. This uh, model that is the basis of most of the techniques that we apply for dealing with this or, or doing diagnostics has been criticized as being uh, not very realistic. So this model basically assumes that there is, there is one source of variation that affects all items and of course if you have things like priming effects such as how you answer to i4 affecting how you answer to i5 then this kind of model would not capture it. So this model has been criticized and before you apply this kind of models in your research you should understand the criticism. This uh, article by Spectre and all other work that he has written about method variance is very useful in understanding the limitations and understanding how you can do a more thoughtful modeling of measurement effects. But this is a commonly used technique so it's fairly uh, it's important to understand what are the drawbacks of this, te this technique or the family of technique that apply this kind of single factor to be able to, to review work done using these techniques. Then how big of a problem is common method variance? There is actually disagreement on this. Podzakov's paper highly cited in 2012 puts a uh, common method variance states that it's a big problem by looking at these, these estimated percentages that are for example Cote and Buckley says the variance of indicators 42% is attributable to the constructs, 26% to the method which would imply that the method variance is uh, almost um, a bit more than half of the actual trait variance in the indicators. That would be a big problem. But then again these uh, studies have also been questioned and whether these studies have used realistic models to do the variance decomposition, we can always ask, ask that question. The, the bottom line is that if a reviewer challenges your study based on a method variance problem and cites this evidence then you need to either demonstrate that this evidence is actually not valid which is difficult to do and or you need to uh, show that the issue is not uh, relevant in your study or not does not affect your study which also is difficult to do. So the method variance problem is, is something like when someone knows that you may have it then you have a, a set of bad options available. We don't know whether it's, it's real or not, but there is there's evidence that can be cited that supports the claim that method variance is a big problem. Method variance issues are also a common reason for rejection. Of course, uh, method variance uh, problems, uh, they correlate with other problems. So weak designs, uh, typically if you want to have a, a causal claim, you need to have time difference, time delay between the cause and the effect 
so that the cause is measured now and the effect is measured after an appropriate time period. If you do a cross-sectional study then of course the delay does not occur so it's difficult to, uh, to establish the direction of causality. But the, these uh, tend to be uh, one of the reasons for rejection. This journal does not categorically reject any, any studies with potential method variance problem but it's, it's like one of the main reasons among other reasons that, that lead to rejection. How do people then address method variance problems? Of course the, an ideal scenario you have a study where you design it in a way that method variance is not a problem. For example you measure uh, innovativeness using a survey, you measure performance using accounting data. It will be difficult to argue that those are affected by the measurement method because they are measured using different methods. But there are a couple of post hoc techniques. These are techniques that you can apply after data have been collected. And these can be divided into two categories. We have techniques that detect method variance problems and techniques that detect and control for method variance problems. So the first category of these techniques or first class of techniques is what I call as correlational techniques. And these correlational techniques basically you take the, uh, the normal data correlation covariance matrix or whatever data that you have and you only have measured those variables of interest that you have and you only have used one measurement method. So you're basically trying to explain correlations using different factor analysis techniques and uh, techniques that belong to this class are harmless single factor test, single factor configure factor analysis and various partial correlation procedures and unmeasured later method factor design. I'll talk about these techniques in a moment. The second class is techniques where you have actually uh, measured the uh, source of method variance or you have marker variables. If you think that your, uh, your measures are subjective to uh, social desirable bias, one way to deal with that issue is to uh, include items that measure that bias specifically. So there are different measures for uh, how people like to respond to the right hand side or left hand side, social desirability, self um, leniency, other kinds of things. So you can measure the causes of the bias if possible. Another strategy is to apply a marker variable. The idea of a marker variable is that you measure a construct that is theoretically unrelated to the, uh, the constructs that you study. For example, uh, one marker that people sometimes apply is whether the person likes the color blue or not. And that's, it's very difficult to see how, how, how much you like blue would be uh, cor correlated with, for example, company performance. And uh, the idea is that you measure something unrelated using the same scale format and same measurement instrument than the, the uh, interesting construct and if those interesting construct and marker are correlated then that correlation is solely due to the method and that can be used to estimate the method variance. So this is a, a second class of technique. A third class of technique is, is multiple method techniques and, and this is not very common. Multi-thread multi-method matrices would be here. For example uh, you can uh, measure something using uh, a pen and paper survey and then you can call back and the informants and measure the same questions using a telephone interview. So that's one way, not very common. Then we have instrumental variables. Instrumental variables are a general solution but they may not be very realistic. More generally these uh, techniques can be characterized into uh, two more categories. Questionable, te questionable techniques and impractical techniques. So uh, then you need to uh, Basically choosing a technique is to uh, choose the least questionable practical technique. Correlation of techn uh, instrumental variables are not, not practical. The reason why they are not practical is that when you do a survey study typically your measures come, your, all your data comes from that survey and if you think that the survey as uh, measurement instruments affects the items then uh, your instrument of variable would be something that comes from a source other than the survey. Because if your instrument comes from the survey then it's very difficult to uh, argue that that instrument would not be affected by the biases that the person has when they answer a survey instrument. So 
typically the instruments would need to come from databases and you need large numbers so uh, not very practical to do. Then we have impractical and a bit questionable multiple method techniques. Impractical to call all the informants or impractical to establish multiple methods and these techniques also make assumptions that are sometimes difficult to justify. Then we have correlation techniques. These are very questionable. I talk about those techniques uh, in another video but the, the bottom line is that these models are very seldom identified and they're not identified because you cannot check whether correlation between two items is because they measure correlated constructs or whether that correlation is due to the measurement procedure. So from a cross-section with no markers or no measured uh, sources of method variance you simply cannot identify what is the source of correlation. Marker variables and, and measured uh, method variance techniques are a bit less questionable whether uh, you actually uh, whether the simplistic model of a single factor is, is appropriate that can be called into question but more thoughtful way of constructing your models where you model different sources of bias and you measure them with direct measures or markers may be something that you can work with. However, particularly with markers, there are some issues about model identification that the literature has not really addressed this far. I'll talk about those issues in another video. Let's take a look at uh, what these techniques do using a simplified example. So we have the simplified single factor model where we have two constructs and then uh, we have a method here and this is actually a bifactor model with correlated minor factors. Now the link between these method factor models and bifactor models is not very strong in the literature in, in, in the sense that this uh, method variance literature seems to develop largely uh, detached from the bifactor literature but these are the same models. Then uh, before we proceed it's important to again uh, repeat that uh, this, this model itself has been called uh, a bit questionable because there are sources of meta variation that do not follow this kind of simple model. For example item context effects, implicit theories and others. This model would do nothing to address those, those sources of bias. Paul Spector's work addresses the problems of this general approach. So not all measures are affected equally and uh, there are more than one source of positive bias and the evidence of existence of general bias is weak and questionable anyway. So that's uh, Paul Spector's argument. So he does not believe that this, this model adequately presents any measurement method effects. So that's why he calls it a myth. He does not say that there is no such thing as method variance. He just says that it's a myth, that it's a single source it is more complicated than that. Let's take a look at these postdoc techniques for addressing method variance and let's start with the correlation techniques. So the correlation technique is basically a technique where we take the original indicators and we simply fit a different model and uh, we see what happens. <coughs> this is the Harman's single factor test and, and this is uh, basically uh, the first test that people learn and it's, it's not a useful test at all. So we are simply take the, all the data that we have and we fit a single factor model. If the single factor model fits well, then uh, we conclude, if the single factor model explains large amount of variation in the data, then we conclude that method variance is a problem. If not, then we conclude that it's not a problem. This technique has uh, two main problems. One problem is that it's not clear how much uh, variance the method should explain for that to be con considered problematic. So that's one problem. That's a more obvious problem. A less obvious problem but the more severe problem is that uh, this method factor also explains the between construct correlation. So if you consider this as uh, like a bifactor model then uh, the general factor in the bifactor model basically explains what is the correlation between the minor factors. And that's, that's what we have here. So if we have two highly correlated constructs but no method variance, this model would say that the method factor explains the data to, to a, a large degree because the items indeed are highly correlated because they measure two different things. So, so we cannot say from this model whether the, uh, the variance explained by this factor is due to the method or whether it's due to the two highly correlated constructs. This is 
generally a technique that people recommend against. But nevertheless, because it's simple to apply, you see it applied quite a lot. There is one particular variant of this technique that is even more problematic. And sometimes you see this technique applied with a converter factor analysis. Then researchers check uh, the model fit indices and they conclude that the model doesn't fit well. So what is the null hypothesis being tested there? It is that the method factor explains all variation, all co-variation of the items in the data. So what we are basically testing with this converter factor analysis model of single factor is that there is, there is no construct related, related variance whatsoever in the indicators and it is purely method variance. And that is of course uh, a rather extreme case. So if you have like 40% like uh, construct variance, 20% method variance, that would be a problematic case already. So you don't need to have like 100% variation explained by the method to, for that to be considered a problem. So uh, no trait variance in the indicators, that's what the converter factor analysis tests. So this is not a useful technique. And uh, Podzakov's paper, for example, says, says that as well. They say that this is commonly used, but it's not useful. Unmeasured latent method factor, this is considered a lot more rigorous and it's applied in confronter factor analysis. But this too is a bit problematic. And how people usually apply this is that uh, you, construct, uh, you con constrain the first indicator of the method factor for, for scale setting but you also constrain the other loadings to be the same. And uh, that is uh, done by, done for identification purposes that are typically not explained in more detail. So, uh, so what's the problem with this model? Well, there are a couple of problems. First, it's, uh, the first problem was that yes, there are identification problems. I'll talk more about these problems. In another video, this is actually a, a great understatement. So this model has serious identification problems and I generally would not trust the results of this kind of model ever because uh, you simply cannot identify whether the correlation between A indicators and B indicators are because of A and B correlate or because of the method factor. For the conditions under which this is identified or strongly identified are something that you wouldn't normally encounter in research practice. Another uh, problem with this model, of course, is that the, the single factor model is, is unrealistic. Uh, but nevertheless, this is often considered the state of the art. And how people actually apply this technique is also problematic. Quite often uh, people apply this and then they conclude that the model does not fit better than a model without the single, uh, without the single factor and then they conclude the method variance is not a problem without even interpreting how much variation the method factor explains. Second, when you constrain these indicators to be uh, equal, you are saying that uh, method affects all indicators equally. That's unrealistic assumption. And it also pretty much guarantees that this model will uh, not improve the model fit because you are including a factor that should not fit. So you're basically including a misspecified model. So you're artificially creating a scenario where this model cannot fit better than a model without the common method factor. And, and basically your test is just uh, going to uh, indicate no problem if you apply that way. I'll have another video of how you actually should apply and interpret these techniques. Then you have marker variable techniques and measurement te measured uh, method techniques. And uh, the idea of, uh, of these, uh, we have first partial correlation procedures and the idea of these partial correlations procedures is that uh, we, we somehow estimate the degree of method variance. For example, we take a, a marker indicator and then we take a, an indicator of interest. We check their correlation and uh, that correlation should be zero if there is no method variance in the data. Then we take that correlation, we subtract that correlation from the sample co correlation matrix uh, from every other correlation in the sample correlation matrix. And uh, then we have the adjusted correlation matrix. We use that for our analysis. This is equivalent to uh, having uh, a single method factor that loads on all indicators with the variance fixed before the analysis instead of estimating from the data. So this is basically uh, an unmeasured method factor design except that we fix this variance based on an estimate that we get from a correlation instead of the data. 
So it's uh, a bit problematic that we first take one data set and then we uh, calculate the value for this variance and then we re-estimate the model using the same data set. It would be a lot better to estimate everything at one go. This, um, these methods come from uh, coming different variants. So with the partial correlation procedures, we can have uh, the partial correlation, we can calculate it based on a measured method. So we can, for example, measure social desirability and check how much our social desirability measures correlate with the in interesting study measures. And then we have marker variable techniques. So I explained that already. And then we have a general factor technique, which basically uh, estimates a single factor first. And then you uh, take that single factor out from the data. You parcel the effects of that single factor from the data and you estimate the model using the residuals. So this uh, general factor technique is basically a combination of harmless single factor test, which is not a useful test at all, and the partial correlation technique, which is also questionable. So it's a combination of two questionable techniques. Then we have a measured latent method factor design. This is a, a less questionable technique. So the idea here is that if we have uh, these uh, measures of, of, for example, social desirability bias, then we can add a social desirability factor here and model how much social desirability affects the indicators. This is identified and it's actually a bi factor S minus I model talked about uh, that I, I'd and co-authors discuss. And it's, it's uh, as a model, it works really well in terms of identification, but whether it's a realistic way of modeling the measurement effects or whether you need more factors, that, that's debatable. But general principle, if you have a single source of, of method, then this is the, uh, the ideal way of doing so. However, quite often these markers, these indicators, uh, these M indicators are not measures of method variance, but they are markers. And, and, and this is problematic for reasons that I'll explain in another video. So this is called measured latent method factor in Pochakov's paper. And it's, it's a pretty useful technique as long as you have just the one source of method variance. Then we have multiple method techniques. So you, you call, collect the same data using a mail survey and telephone, for example. These are not very practical because you need the two data collection techniques. And in terms of, of how the model works, we have uh, different measures. So let's say x1, x2 and x3 are, are each measured using a different technique. x4, x5 and x6 are each measured using a different technique. And then we have these method factors that are, are technique specific. This works. It's, it's, uh, this particular model is probably not added for that. But as a general principle, this, this works if you can get the multiple indicators. But there are, uh, are issues that make this a bit questionable. And uh, well, there is identification issues. So this is uh, not always identified, particularly if you allow these method factors to be uncorrelated, then this is not always identified. And then the second, the correlated uniqueness models here, this is basically uh, the same model as this one before here but it has method factors that are constrained to be uncorrelated with one another. So this model with correlated uh, error terms is the same as a bi-factor model as I explained in, in the video about co common factor model diagnostics. And uh, whether the uncorrelatedness of these method factors is uh, something that you can uh, support theoretically, that's a bit questionable. So this assumption of uncorrelated methods is difficult to justify. So, and multiple methods generally are not practical. Then we have instrumental variables. So instrumental variables are a general technique for addressing measurement error or endogeneity or, or whatnot. The problem with instruments is that they, it can be difficult to get the instruments. So the idea of an instrumental model is that you are, uh, instrumental variable model is that you actually don't measure the method variance source. So all other techniques that try to address method variance, try to model the source of method variance. Here we, we don't make any assumptions about method variance. So we are not modeling method variance, so we are not doing any assumptions about that. So there are no questionable assumptions about method variance. Instead, we allow the uh, construct A and construct B 
to have a correlated error term and then that is identified because of the instrument. The, uh, the problem with instruments is that while this is a statistically sound approach is that the instruments must be press measured with a different method than the interesting variables. Otherwise how could you argue that the method cannot, un cannot affect the instruments which you need to do to establish the instrument variable exclusion criteria. And quite often if you have let's say let's say five different constructs that explain the dependent variable then you need at least five instruments. So you need large numbers of instruments and the instruments must come from another source which makes this a bit impractical technique in practice. So the summary the post hoc techniques are for addressing common method variance. We have a correlational techniques these are questionable and ineffective. So basically if you did not consider method variance problem in the research design stage there is really not much that you can do about it. I'll, I'll talk more about why these are problematic it relates to identification in another video. Then you have these uh, things that you need to consider in uh, the research design stage. Using markers or using uh, measured method factor method variable method bias sources is probably the least bad practical alternative. Having multiple methods or having instrumental variables is difficult to accomplish in the research design but this is simple to do by adding just more a few more questions that gauge the uh, effect of, of the measurement method in your data into your survey form. However there are arguments against this simplified method that you should take into account and one particularly good uh, source is, is Spector and co-authors in 2019 and they talk about uh, a, a different modeling approach. So the idea of their model modeling approach is that when you do these method factor models you should start modeling the method effects by first reading studies about the measures that you apply and evaluating the measures themselves to see what sources of method variance, variation can affect those items. And then you add method factors for each source. So instead of having this like general factor that affects all items on which most of these techniques are based on, you do a more uh, thoughtful modeling, model building approach. So practical advice on method variance. First, the best way to avoid common method variance and common method bias is to avoid the problem in the first place. So procedural remedies and multiple sources are best. Consider the mechanism for method variance and its expected effect and build your model to model the mechanism to assess how large is the effect. Which effects are present in your study? Are there item context effects, priming effects, social desirability effects and, and uh, others? Uh, Podsakov and co-authors provide a long list of different methods, different sources of bias with references on what you can read to learn more about these bias sources. Then consider the evidence of the strengths of these effects from the methodological literature. So what evidence is there to support that there actually are method variance sources that affect your indicators? And then make informed decisions and evaluate the impact based on this evidence. The correlation techniques postdoc techniques simply do not work. They just uh, they are indefensible. You could perhaps get your study published even with these techniques but you should really say that these techniques these results are preliminary and you should uh, include evidence that prior research that is done with more rigorous techniques has shown that your items that you apply have not been suspect to, to method variance problems or the method variance effect has been small in other contexts, then maybe your results could be trusted. But as a general rule, uh, the post hoc correlation techniques simply don't add much value. I'll talk more about those in another video. Correlation markers uh, and multiple metals, marker variables measured method variance sources and multiple methods can be effective. But to be able to apply this technique, you need to consider those already in the research design stage. 